Hello, it's Bruce Williams again. Today I'd like to present part six of my multi-lecture series on the pathology of the domestic ferret. And we're going to talk about the endocrine, where the two most common syndromes affecting ferrets occur, and which is a major cause of presentation of ferrets to practicing veterinarians and pathologists around the world. As I do with all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues for providing me these images, which allow me to put these lectures together. Here are a couple of ferrets who look just a little bit out of it. You can see the squinty eyes, the not quite with it look uh, to them. Here's another one, and these animals may be drooling as well. They go through these little periods in which they're dissociated from their environment and then they'll pick up and they'll be back to normal at least initially and this is a very common present presenting signs for hypoglycemic animals with a insulin secreting tumor of the pancreas commonly known as an insulinoma insulinomas or islet cell tumors as i generally call them are the most common neoplasm of ferrets they generally arise during the golden period of tumor development to the ferret, which is between four and six years of age. And they manifest by periodic secretion of insulin, which results in moving blood glucose into certain cells, including skeletal muscle and the liver, and deprives the rest of the body for, for the glucose that it needs for its metabolism because the brain is so sensitive to variations in blood glucose levels. Hypoglycemia most often results in neurologic uh, symptoms such as these petite mal seizures and eventually the seizures will become uh, longer and the animal will develop uh, either status epilepticus may become obtunded and go into a coma and may vocalize, which is very characteristic of this condition. Most astute owners pick it up at the condition that we're looking at right now where the animal just sort of trances out, as they say in the, uh, in the literature. Grossly, islet cell tumors don't occur in large numbers. There may be one or two they're usually a dark red color because tumors tend to recapitulate the tissues they come from. Uh, anything that secretes hormone is heavily vascularized, as are these tumors. They're not white and similar to the surrounding pancreas like we saw with the hyperplasia of the exocrine pancreas when we were talking about the liver and pancreas in an early lecture. Now here's an important note about the pancreas of the ferret. We talked before how pancreases are obligate carnivores. Their diet in the wild is primarily protein with very little plant material, sometimes only what's in the uh, uh, GI tract of prey species. Consequently, they move this material through the gut very quickly with an average transit time of about four hours, and you need a lot of pancreas to do that. They have the common duodenal arm which contains the pancreatic duct and bile ducts actually pass through this as well but they also have another 50 percent of the pancreas which curls around the stomach as well twice as much pancreas allows them to process food twice as quickly but it also gives them another 50 percent of pancreas to develop these tumors in The problem with islet cell tumors is they're probably caused by a complex of factors, one of which is the fact that the diets that we feed them tend to be a lot more high in carbohydrates than their natural diets. These tumors will develop and clinical signs can be controlled surgically by removing them. But we found that about 40% of the animals which have surgery for pancreatic tumors will require another surgery within 10 months for development of additional tumors which may be too small to pick up at surgery. Consequently, a number of surgeons will remove half of the pancreas 
which not only decreases the room to uh, uh, develop additional tumors by 50%, but you have to make sure that you remove that gastric arm of the pancreas. If you take out the duodenal arm, you're also going to take out the pancreatic and bile ducts, and that is not compatible with life. So these tumors are removed either by nodulectomy or a partial pancreatectomy to control clinical signs. It's an extremely common tumor, and not all of these appear to be functionally or clinically significant and may be a common finding in the necropsy of very geriatric animals, which adds to the overall numbers that we see in ferrets. Histologically, they illustrate the adage that tumors try to recapitulate the tissues that they come from. And this is an islet cell tumor. It is unencapsulated and actually looks just like a huge islet. And you can see that there are a couple of islets in the tissue around it. This one is not encapsulated. This one is encapsulated. And people have tried to make the case that if they're encapsulated, they're less likely to metastasize and should be called adenomas. And if they're unencapsulated, they're more likely to metastasize because nothing's holding them back. But the bottom line is that a, a ferret is not a cat, nor is it a dog. And whereas an islet cell tumor is generally bad news in cats and dogs, we call them small bag diseases because the survival time is short that you don't want to buy a big bag of dog food. But in ferrets, they almost never metastasize. In 25 years, I've seen about two metastasize, and those went to the local lymph nodes. So their activity is very difficult, or is very different from dogs and cats. Um, they tend to respond to surgery if the animal is young enough to have surgery. If not, they're often controlled and non-surgical candidates by high doses of prednisone, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, and the result of giving high doses of prednisone to a ferret for a very long time. So these are islet cell tumors. They're extremely common, um, and they are the number one most common tumor in this species. Okay, let's talk about the second most common neoplasm and the first most common cause of presentation of ferrets to their vets uh, with, you know, not including uh, normal health checks and vaccinations. And this is adrenal-associated endocrinopathy. A lot of people call it adrenal disease. Just make sure you realize from the get-go that this is not Cushing's disease. A dog is not a cat. Uh, a ferret is not a dog is not a cat. can't remember my own quotes. A uh, ferret is not a cat is not a dog. And so this is a very different syndrome than Cushing's disease. Uh, one of the reasons that it is so commonly a cause of presentation is because even the least attentive owner who may miss the, uh, the occasional trances caused by insulinoma generally knows when its ferret is going bald. And here we have a classic truncal bilateral alopecia that's also affecting the tail and the feet. But my experience with adrenal disease in ferrets is that it is the number one, number two, and number three cause of hair loss. And it can occur anywhere on the body. I've seen it just on the tops of the feet. I've seen it just in the center of the head. Anytime a ferret is losing hair for an unknown reason, you think about adrenal disease and you rule that one out first. This is a fairly mild case and a picture I got from Dr. Eric Stauber about 30 years ago and I'm still using that great picture. And another one from Dr. Pete Fisher. Um, and this is an adorable animal and I believe that there is a market out there for bald ferrets. Um, but they do have other problems associated when they have no hair coat. So you have to knit them little sweaters. And this condition takes five or six years to develop. So um, if you think about marketing bald ferrets, it's probably not the best business model. But it's not a difficult condition to uh, recognize. Now, you don't use a lot of charts in these lectures but we need to look at the causes of adrenal disease in ferrets. And occasionally you'll see similar syndromes in mice, but it's very different than what we see in the dog and cat. Adrenal disease in dog and cat is caused by the hyperfunction of the adrenal gland, which releases too much cortisol. That is not what happens in ferrets. 
if we look at ferrets, ferrets are they are seasonal breeders. And at the beginning of every season, as the days get longer, the hypothalamus releases a substance called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which acts upon the pituitary gland and causes an elevation in the circulating levels of two important hormones which prepare the gonads, the testes and the ovaries, to come into season. These two hormones are luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, both very important hormones. But you can go ahead and forget about follicle stimulating hormone because the important hormone in this condition is luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone will circulate around the body and it will wake up the ovaries and will wake up the testes and will stimulate them to produce eggs and sperm respectively and the animal will go into season. Okay, what happens when you neuter these animals at a very early age and you remove those ovaries or those testes in the male? Well, the hypothalamus and the pituitary doesn't know that. The pituitary continues to secrete higher and higher levels of luteinizing hormone, waiting for a signal from the ovaries and the testes to stop with the luteinizing hormone. But it never gets it. Eventually, over a period of years, the cells in the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis, the two inner layers of the adrenal cortex, will finally get fed up and they will say, okay, we got to do something and they will begin to produce hormones that are normally produced in the gonads, specifically estrogen, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and testosterone. And they produce it in a level to try and shut down the continuing production of luteinizing hormone. Well, these cells will grow, they will become very large, and they will become either hyperplastic or actually neoplastic in response to the unremitting effect of high levels of luteinizing hormone. Here's a quick pop quiz. Can you identify the animal with adrenal disease? Well, actually, they probably all have it in various stages. This is the one with the most advanced case of adrenal disease. It's extremely common in ferrets today. So the effects of adrenal disease are numerous besides the loss of the hair coat. In spayed females, you will see changes in the vulva that are mimicking those seen in intact females. The fibroblasts of the vulva are extremely sensitive to levels of estrogen and progesterone and will become hyperplastic and the vulva actually swells and it's a signal for male ferrets. But this animal has already been neutered so there's no reason for that. So we know that this animal is suffering from an, a sex hormone secreting hyperplastic or neoplastic lesion of the adrenal cortex. Uh, male ferrets, even female ferrets, will also uh, replicate uh, sexual behavior, mounting, grabbing the females by the neck and dragging them around even though they're neutered. One of the things that we don't see or extremely rarely see in probably less than 5% of cases is any change in the bone marrow. High levels of estrogen are generally suppressive to the bone marrow's production of all three lines of cells, including immature erythrocytes, leukocytes, and megakaryocytes, subsequently platelets. And as we'll see, in, see later when we talk about the reproductive system, this is a major cause of mortality in unbred intact female ferrets because they, are, they undergo a continuous breeding cycle until they're bred or spayed or taken out of season in some fashion. It is the motion of coitus that will cause them to come out of season. And if they're not bred by a male ferret and they're, they're intact, the unrelenting uh, effect of estrogen on the bone marrow can result in mortalities 
uh, as high as 50% in unbred females. But this does not happen with the adrenal animals, even though they're secreting high levels of estrogen. Uh, not every animal with adrenal disease will secrete estrogen. They can secrete all three of the hormones, that progesterone and testosterone, in various amounts. They can secrete all of them. They can secrete metabolites. The three I mentioned are the ones that are tested for when people send blood off to be tested for sex hormones in ferrets. The high levels of estrogen do not cause bone marrow suppression, so at least we don't have to worry about that. Let's talk a little bit about surgical approaches, which has really uh, become much more effective since I was in practice. Early on back in the 90s, mostly available literature said that for some reason, adrenal tumors most often arose up to 90% in the left adrenal gland, and that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But as I started autopsying ferrets and looking at the normal anatomy, here is if we're looking down into the ferret. So left is right, right is left. Here are the two kidneys here. Here is the left adrenal gland, and it sits at the cranial pole. Both of them sit at the cranial pole of the, uh, of the adrenals. This one sits at the left adrenal, and notice it just sort of sits there. And it's pretty easy to take out. The right adrenal, unfortunately, sits under the caudate lobe of the liver, which has been flipped back, and it curls around the posterior vena cava, which often runs right through the center of it, which is the largest vein in the body. So if you're doing your first adrenalectomy to cure this, which adrenal are you going to take out? The easily removed left adrenal or the right adrenal? which has the world's largest vein coursing in and around it. Well, of course, you're going to take out the left adrenal, so that skewed the, uh, the data for quite a while. As additional surgical approaches um, became popular for adrenalectomy, including cryotherapy or microvascular surgery, uh, the, the data has gone back to normal. And it's about 50-50 for these tumors. A lot of these neoplasms um, will arise in both adrenals. And many uh, animals that had a potential cure, a temporary cure for this disease by removing one adrenal, eventually had to get uh, the second adrenal removed. And I know we were all taught in veterinary school that you can't remove both adrenals, but you actually can in ferrets for two reasons. One, they respond very well to uh, uh, monthly injections of fluoronef or other mineral corticoids so we can provide the hormones that they need um, the rest of their life um, by injection. Second thing is ferrets have a tremendous amount of ectopic adrenal cortical tissue scattered through their abdomen. Um, this little cluster right here, this little bit of white right here, may actually be ectopic adrenal cortical tissue. It's common in about 40 or 50 percent of ferrets to find these little bits of tissue. I was often get them as biopsies. So, so they do have a lot of extra adrenal cortical tissue we're not used to seeing in other species. So surgical treatment is, uh, uh, is very well documented. Within the last 10 or 15 years, a number of injectable uh, medications have been utilized um, and even implanted in ferrets to decrease the amount or combat the amount of uh, receptors occupied on normal adrenal glands by luteinizing hormone um, and to prevent the development of these tumors rather than treat them after they have already developed. As a pathologist, you will probably see a lot of these tumors, and they can get very difficult. I try to keep my diagnoses simple. This is a normal ferret adrenal gland with the outside zona glomerulosa, zona fascicularis, zona reticularis, and the medulla. This may be the only normal you ever see. These lesions can be classified into hyperplasia, adenoma or neoplasia. And your classification doesn't mean all that much because they generally pursue a benign course after removal. Um, and even the diagnosis of a carcinoma can be associated with a good prognosis if the adrenal gland was removed early enough. Only one type of 
these neoplasms, the myxoid variant of carcinomas tend to metastasize. The rest only metastasize very, very late in the course of disease. I keep it very simple. If I can identify a single nodule within the adrenal gland, and usually you do not see contralateral effects, I'll call an adenoma. If I see multiple nodules, multiple discrete nodules throughout the cortex, I will call it hyperplasia. And if I can't tell where normal cortex starts and ends from abnormal cortex, I will call it a carcinoma. These very large carcinomas are the ones that were not caught early, the ones that you do need to be careful of metastasis. And if the carcinoma has large, large lakes of dropout and mucin material. You may be dealing one, with one of the myxoid carcinomas that was published in the early 2000s by Dr. Matty Cupel, and that is one that has a high rate of metastasis. There are a couple of other lesions that you will see uh, not uncommonly in ferrets, and this is an absolutely great picture by Dr. Uh, Unita Bryant from the University of Kentucky. And this is the right adrenal gland. And I see this most commonly in hyperplastic right adrenals. And here's a cyst that's been incised. And you can see sort of this waxy, homogenous, hard material within the adrenal gland. And this is from developmental adrenal cysts. There's been a little bit of research into this uh, it, incidental finding. It doesn't cause any clinical signs. turns out that uh, the lining of these cysts is biliary epithelium, and it will uh, be immunoreactive to cytokeratin 7 and 17. And these are present in the gland during development. They don't shut down, and over the years, they will secrete this sort of waxy secretory material which clots very hard on exposure to air and a lot of times it'll be dissected out and all you get is this waxy homogeneous material to look at with no adrenal gland but you can go ahead and say that it's an incidental finding it arises in cysts in hyperplastic right adrenal glands i don't know if i've ever seen it in a normal adrenal gland um, usually it's associated with uh, other forms of, of proliferative disease in the adrenal cortex, usually hyperplasia, and it's usually on the right side. Here's a case series of, series of four that we published at the AFIP uh, back in the late 1990s. And uh, ferrets do a lot of crazy things with their adrenal. If it's an adrenal gland, it can be crazy. And there were a number of cases in which the animal was uh, had its abdomen x-rayed for any number of reasons and the veterinarians noticed that there were bilateral bony densities in the areas of the adrenal gland. These animals did not suffer from hair loss or any other sign of adrenal disease but they did go in, they removed one or both adrenals and they submitted them for uh, uh, for examination. And in this adrenal gland, you can see hair, you can see some bone here. This is not your normal adrenal gland. And histologically, what we have is a teratoma. A teratoma results, it's a neoplasm, results in the development of fully formed tissues in, the, uh, uh, in abnormal locations. And this ovary contains bone, a developing tooth, haired skin with sebaceous glands, and fat and more skin here. So we, we documented four of these teratomas. They're uncommon tumors of the adrenal gland. Most species get them in the gonads, but ferrets decide that they want to do them in their adrenal glands, and that's okay with me. Okay, we have one more condition in the endocrine system. Uh, we haven't discussed a lot of conditions, but uh, when you talk about pancreases and, and adrenals and ferrets, that is a tremendous number of uh, surgical submissions and findings at autopsy. Okay, we talked earlier about, uh, we talked about a number of immune diseases and then we talked earlier about insulinoma. And both of these 
diseases are interlinked because they are treated with steroids. And steroids are not a bad drug in ferrets. Steroids tend to, or ferrets tend to be very tolerant of steroids. Uh, they do not generally manifest with a stress-related leukogram with a, a high level of neutrophils when they're administered steroids. And they can take it for a fairly long time. Non-surgical candidates with insulinoma are treated with steroids to try to increase circulating blood glucose. Animals with immune-mediated disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease, often get daily doses of oral steroids to try to tamp down the out-of-control immune system in the gut. Well, in a certain number of ferrets, there's a price to be paid for months, if not years, of administering steroids. And because it potently antagonizes insulin, it will over time do damage to the islets of Langerhans. And you can see, rather than having the normal pink cytoplasm, these cells are excessively swollen. They have... Uh, tremendous amounts of glycogen. And this is a very characteristic finding in any species for diabetes mellitus. And the typical clinical picture of this is that an animal um, has been on glucose for a number, oh, sorry, on steroids for a number of months and the owner is monitoring the blood glucose. And it normally registers at, oh, 40 if it doesn't get its prednisone, 70 or 80 if it does. And it's been monitored very well uh, carefully daily for months and it's very stable then all of a sudden it spikes to 200 the next day is 300 and after that it's 500 and that was because finally the islets have just thrown up their hands the animals passed into a type 2 form of of diabetes mellitus that's drug induced and unfortunately once that happens we are unable to reverse the project the uh, the product and these animals need to be on insulin for the remainder of their lifetime and ferrets are steroid resistant they're also fairly insulin resistant as well and the normal forms of insulin have to be administered either two or four times a day to maintain a steady blood glucose in the normal range and that's very difficult for most people to do so diabetes mellitus usually secondary to chronic prednisone administration Okay, well that brings us to the end of the endocrine system. Uh, I know it was uh, almost 30 minutes for only three diseases, but two of the three are extremely important in this species and you absolutely need to know about them. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. We'll see you next time. We're going to talk about the uh, urinary system of the ferret. Have a great day.